Hello, everybody. This is Lisa Johnson from Everbridge. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our webinar is Telemedicine, a Quality Initiative for Concussion Management with Sydney Markham. Uh, we're going to do a brief agenda today, some logistics and introduction, and then Sydney will go into an overview of concussion and sports in the United States, an overview of the challenges to care for athletes who are hurt on the field, an overview of how she crafted her study, the results, and the interpretation of the study. So uh, if you would like to follow us on Twitter, we are at EB Healthcare, and we would love to have you follow us. We talk about clinical care and telemedicine on a regular basis, so please join us there. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Sydney Markham. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> it's good to have you here. Uh, Sydney is a practicing nurse practitioner at Spine Institute Northwest Sports Medicine Division in Tacoma, Washington. She recently completed her doctorate of nursing practice in 2016 from Frontier Nursing University and actually today's presentation is based on her doctorate research. She was elected as a fellow in the American Academy of Nurse Practitioners in 2013 and she has been active in health policy for several years serving on the National Advisory Council on Nursing Education and practice for the Health Resources and Services Administration from 2005 to 2010. Sydney does work with student athletes. She has been involved with them for many years and uh, this is one of the reasons that led her to do her research. We are very happy to have you here today, Dr. Markham. Thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me. And I am going to turn the dashboard over to you. So my, as um, Lisa said, my name is Sid Markman and I'm a nurse practitioner and this was based on my um, doctorate project, um, Telemedicine Con uh, Quality Initiative for Concussion Management. I first wanted to start with a poll and find out how many of those that are listening uh, actually manage concussions as part of their clinical practices. Thank you so much for voting. Wow, we've got 80% of you voting. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to close this poll in just a couple more seconds. Okay, and I will share the results. And it, it I have to say it snuck in at the last minute as a tie. <laughs> so, so about half um, work with half of the clinicians today work with concussions, the other half do not at this time. Oh, awesome. Okay, thank you. Yep. So let's just talk about keeping athletes safe. Um, concussions were actually first described in the medical literature um, in a New England journal, um, or a British journal, medical journal in 1872. Uh, keeping athletes safe after a sports concussion is paramount. As research is, demonstrates that more is known about sports concussion um, and much more is yet to be learned. Concussions have come to the forefront in recent years, including the class action lawsuit that was settled in 2016 against the NFL and the helmet manufacturer Rydell in the United States uh, Court of Appeals in the Third Circuit. Uh, the movie industry has also uh, played an important part of public awareness in concussions with the uh, movie release of uh, movie concussion. In 2009, Washington State became the first state in the nation to pass legislation specifically requiring concussion safety uh, for, met, for youth who suffered a concussion at a public venue. The Lystead Law was named for Zachary Lystead, who uh, was, as a result of a concussion, Zachary suffered a life-threatening injury during an eighth grade football game. Zachary was injured with a concussion and then was returned to play not once, but twice during the same game. Shortly after the game, he collapsed and his life was forever altered by the poor management decisions to return him to play before he was fully recovered. Currently, um, from the work of the NFL and one of Zachary's physicians, a version of the Lysted Law is now active in all 50 states in the District of Columbia, drawing even more attention to the need for concussion resources and management. 
Although there are laws that require removal from play and web-based resources available for concussion education, there are no real-time interactive concussion management resources currently available. Within Washington State, there are geographic barriers such as the Cascade Mountain Range and many island communities that do not allow patients immediate access to a concussion specialist. What does exist in many schools in Washington State is a certified athletic trainer, or ATC, that's used to guide the athlete through the initial stages of the recovery process, especially if there is no identified primary care provider. The ATC works in close collaboration with the athlete, the coach, and the family during the rehabilitation process and is legally certified to return an athlete to play after the concussion. The ATC must, by Washington law, have an established guideline with another licensed provider of which nurse practitioners qualify to provide state treatment, rehabilitation, and reconditioning services to athletes. Unfortunately, many athletic trainers do not have a medical provider experienced in concussion management available to help guide them or to refer them for backup assistance. And specialty care may be hours away depending on that athletic trainer's location. The lack of available providers to support these athletic trainers create a healthcare inequity and potential safety issue for the athletes. Telemedicine is one potential solution for this problem. So I have another poll for you. Um, I want to know in the audience how many uh, of those listening think a majority of concussions in youth are caused by team sports. And we want to thank everybody for voting and share the results. So what do you think of that, Dr. Markham? I can't see it. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 20% um, said that they are due to other reasons. 25% said yes, most youth concussions come from team sports. And 55% said it's about a 50-50 split between team sports and other Awesome. Thank you. And here's what we know about concussions. Concussion is a form of, my, of traumatic brain injury and is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality in the United States. The CDC estimates TBI is responsible for an estimated 2.5 million emergency visits today and costs about $76.5 billion per year. Uh, Fish Lombardi Masters Abergasson's on for a lens 2016 did a re retrospective study and found the rates of sports concussion to be highest among football and girls soccer players. Uh, another study by Mar McKelvin uh, Fields and Comstock in 2012 uh, found that boys football and girls soccer have the highest concussion rate in high school. Concussions occur across the wild wide age group. They further concluded that the under, understanding the injury mechanism, uh, the sport specific concussion rates, and risk factors are the best drivers of prevention and intervention. A meta-analysis by uh, Dismuk Walker and Ajiti concluded more research is needed for the global financial impact of concussion and TBI. Interestingly, it was noted that in the United States, the highest cost of TBI treatment occurred in California and Washington. And while sports and while sports and media while media attention uh, focuses on uh, concussion in sports, the majority of concussions still, by CDC estimates, occur from motor vehicle accidents, falls, and trauma, and um, although the, the number of sports concussion injuries do appear to be rising, and that reason for that is unknown. It is also important to note that TBI symptoms need to be closely monitored by a healthcare provider after removal from play. Suboptimal treatment of TBI can lead to chronic comorbidities affecting patients and families across the lifespan and currently is responsible for an estimated 30% of injury-related deaths um, by the CDC. The effects of TBI can include impaired cognition and memory, coordination and movement difficulties, 
visual and hearing changes, and emotional functioning such as personality or mood, cha mood changes. Clark and Guska Guskowitz in 2016 found that activities requiring prolonged concentration, such as paying attention in a classroom and doing homework or testing, can worsen the physical symptoms associated with a TBI or concussion. They found that the co cognitive symptoms may continue after physical symptoms improve or resolve. <clears throat> the cog cognitive related symptoms of TBI require, may require learning accommodations that are facilitated by a healthcare provider to provide for a gradual return to learn and continued academic success. Wasserman, Bavarian, Mapstrand, Block, and Wingarden in 2016 also found that concussed athletes took an average of four days to return to school when compared to non-concussed injured athletes, and 61% still had some learning difficulties as late as one month after the injury. Early intervention, therefore, is essential. <clears throat> Pediatric primary care providers and emergency medical provi emergency medicine providers regularly care for concussed patients, although they may not have adequate training or infrastructure to diagnose or systemically manage patients. Education, decision tool support tools, and patient information could enhance and standardize concussion management. Health information technology is an essential part of the national goal for reducing healthcare costs, improving access, and reducing the current inequity between rural and urban areas. It is one method that can help uh, with telemedicine to improve access to care and reduce this inequity. The project success that we did depended on um, the patient, the provider, and the parent optimizing and supporting the, um, the new delivery systems. Um, for that reason, I used the normalization process theory, which studied how people work together. It had four constructs, including um, internal reflection, participation in developing relationships, collective action in operation, um, and reflective monitoring and evaluation. It is a relatively new sociologic-based theory developed to assist the clinician in evaluating factors that both facilitate and inhibit adapt adaptation of complex interventions into everyday practice. It is not concerned with how people work to implement a process, more that they understand why the process is being adopted. I also use the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, IHI, and the Associated for Process Improvements model of the Plan, Do, Study Act um, to test whether the changes that occurred were due to the improvements in the, in the type of care that were delivered. And what we did was um, we would do short bursts of um, an intervention and then evaluate, did this work, did this not work, what do we need to do to change it, and I got input along the way from all of the stakeholders that were involved. The specific aims of the project were to increase athlete safety with concussion management to provide timely, equitable, efficient, and effective access to a concussion specialist while providing provider satisfaction with telemedicine because if the providers weren't satisfied, we knew that they weren't going to use it long term. Um, the telemedicine um, conference, um, although we limited it to the western Washington area, we um, wanted to eliminate travel between the concussion specialists um, all over the area and um, the trainers and the students. The athletic trainers provided treatment um, if they had the established guidelines, um, so we used a standardized set of um, protocols for treatment of concussion. Um, 65, I did a pre-screening um, context with the athletic trainers to get demographics and found that 65% of the athletic trainers that we used were between the ages of 22 and 30. 23 of them were employed by ATI Physical Therapy and two by um, another physical therapy company and one by an independent school district. Um, this demographic was really important to the um, study because these were younger providers that were um, 
interested in technology. They readily adapted to the technology. This is the Twitter generation, and um, they were really interested in adopting new and um, innovative means of practice. I also extended an interview to ARMPs United, which is the Washington State Nurses, Nurse Practitioner Association. Um, there's about 6,100 nurse practitioners in the state of Washington, and um, most are involved in primary care per their, uh, the ARMPs United president. Um, we also used, um, did it during the fall sports season, which was football and girls soccer, as those have the highest concussion rates. And it was really important to have a form of HIPAA compliant technology in in utilizing this project. So to do the project, we did a SWOT analysis uh, to look at strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats. Um, project management software was utilized to produce a Gantt chart. Um, and then HIPAA Bridge was utilized uh, for our software. Uh, it was available both in texting and video format. It was free. It could be utilized on a smartphone or tablet. Um, so that the trainers did not need to have a computer and internet access available to use it. It could be used either on Wi-Fi or cellular uh, data networks. So this made the platform uh, more portable. I could use it on the sidelines or in the training room uh, in the uh, athlete's home if needed. And uh, it just was um, something that was very easily accessible and because of the uh, cost it was uh, affordable. Uh, ARMPs were united were uh, invited to the AANP National Conference. ATI and Performance Physical Therapy had training in early August. I developed some wallet cards to talk about access information, uh, developed a website for backup supplies and then um, I and taught them all how to do um, SCAT3 analysis or went over how to do a SCAT3 analysis. And SCAT3 is um, the sports concussion assessment tool, the version 3, which is the most current. It's um, a pen and paper form of uh, concussion assessment. Um, it also includes the not only the cognitive domain, but also the uh, uh, motor domains, uh, unlike the impact tool, and again was something that did not need to have a computer base um, to be relied on and was free. Um, impact testing cost, I think it's $25 per test. Um, we did pre and post satisfaction surveys, uh, pre mainly to get demographics and then post to um, assess whether or not um, the trainers liked the um, ability to do telemedicine visits and then uh, once all of that training was done um, commenced with doing telemedicine visits and again um, at, at different points stopped to evaluate whether or not what we were doing uh, needed to be revised or revamped and how we could better um, make the process. The interventions, again, we're on that plan, do, study, act model. Uh, we developed a runtime for distance and a runtime for time, looking at um, the research shows that most uh, kids with a concussion have at least a week before they can get in to see either a primary care provider or a um, concussion specialist. Uh, we wanted to get that down to one day. And distance-wise, I mapped uh, from my clinic at Spine Institute to all the trainers in the area. The farthest trainers were 27.9 miles away, um, which with traffic um, could be up to an hour and a half. And um, the goal was to get real-time consultation so that those parents and uh, trainers and students didn't have to travel uh, that distance they could access the specialist in real time. And then finally, um, we did a, a post satisfaction survey to look at the trainers um, and how well they liked the technology and whether they would be willing to continue uh, with this in other seasons. And in fact, they have. Um, it was important to note that there was, in the end, no nurse practitioner involvement. 
um, despite the recruiting and um, several verbal commitments, um, <clears throat> it may have been for several reasons, uh, primarily uh, likely reimbursement issues, uh, using out-of-system providers, and um, age, the average age of the nurse practitioner in a 2016 study by Kaplan and Brown was 50.5 years. And this is a generation who's not grown up or accustomed to um, technology or accepting technology um, <clears throat> in contrast to those young athletic trainers who um, are the, the Twitter age and Snapchat age. So measures um, were to demonstrate improvement in access to a concussion specialist, again, regardless of uh, geographic location, to improve health e equity, and by decreasing the time from injury to the specialist, they in increase athletic safety um, to improve timeliness to care, and again, to demonstrate provider, uh, in this case, the athletic trainer satisfaction as uh, use of telemedicine as a source of care. And um, the analysis was time, distance, and overall satisfaction. Um, and then ethical considerations were uh, patient safety. Uh, this is a very vulnerable population. Um, I, in order to do this, um, went ahead and got coaching credentials, which included fingerprints um, and um, being on record at the OSPI as somebody who um, uh, the uh, OSPI is the uh, Office for <clears throat> Safety and Public uh, Instruction, uh, the state school board, if you will, um, uh, which is teacher credentialing in Washington State. Nurse practitioners and physicians do not need to have um, uh, be fingerprinted at this time. Um, there were no competing interests in the study, and um, it was. Uh, submitted to an IRB, but did not meet the threshold because it's a QI project. So the, again, the pre-implementation survey, as you can see, um, age, most of the providers were under age 30. Um, it was split 50-50 between bachelors and masters. Um, most of them had um, under, 10 year, under eight years of practice. Uh, most of them had spent under 10 years managing concussions and uh, felt that most of the time they were pretty comfortable in managing concussion pre-implementation. Pre um, this is the um, results for the distance. Um, again, when you look at our goal was to have them travel and not or not have any travel and um, what this plotted was um, the distance away from the provider. Um, so most of them were um, at least 10 miles away. And uh, so it did save quite a bit of distance. And then time, um, almost all of the concussions were assessed same day. Um, there's a couple of spikes in here. This was the four-day spike was over a four-day weekend. And I just didn't get to me fast enough. Post-implementation, um, we looked at whether they considered their school urban or rural <clears throat> or suburban. And 40% uh, said urban, 40% said suburban, 20% said rural. Um, they 80% said they used telemedicine. The ones that didn't use telemedicine said they didn't have concussions or didn't need the concussions, didn't need care. On a Likert scale of uh, one to five, they rated the telemedicine experience a four average of 4.75, and um, all of them made comments about the accessibility was awesome. It was easy to use. They loved having access to a specialist right at the sidelines of the game. Um, I, they commented that I was available when they needed to be seen, either on Saturday or Sunday, um, for the some of the youth soccer that was um, um, or var, uh, JV games. Um, we could talk right away with parents about what was best um, to have follow-up. Um, they loved having easy access to the to the providers and that it was a low cost uh, way to manage concussions and that um, they liked having backup um, to get kids 
um, into academic accommodations right away with treatment. The interpretations, um, there are very limited studies with concussion management currently. Um, there is um, a, uh, most of the concussion studies were done by the military or the VA. They're very limited with using student athletes. Uh, there was one um, incident study um, was just a um, case report. Um, other than that, there were no published studies showing what works and what doesn't work. Um, this is a rapidly evolving technology. Um, I think as cost continues to decrease, um, it definitely is something that um, will become more easy to implement, um, especially as the younger generation of providers um, is introduced and demands this technology. The one thing that I found that was really interesting to me and wasn't really something that I was looking for were working parents. Um, I had several schools that really were not that far from my clinic, but had a large population of um, single parent families and um, the parents um, of the school networked with each other and, and would tell the trainer, can't you get Sid to just do one of those telemedicine visits? Um, for them to take off uh, a half day or a day of work to take their, their athlete into the clinic to be seen uh, meant that the family lost four hours of very valuable wages. And, um, and so it was really important to them and really something that they embraced um, and spread the word and demanded and got some support even through the district to try to um, keep this ongoing because it was something that really helped them and it wasn't something that I considered when I started down this road. Um, I think it's an important opportunity, particularly in a um, state that has independent practice as Washington does for nurse practitioners to be able to partner with athletic trainers and to be able to allow athletic trainers um, into more areas and particularly into more rural areas that don't have access to care um, and something that uh, it, it could be a real opportunity. It, um, connectivity and software is really critical and uh, one of the reasons I still love using HIPAA Bridge because um, it is so accessible um, on different platforms and so easy to use. The limitations for the study, most of the participants came from, uh, uh, for athletic trainers came from one company and that being ATI. It was a very limited time period. It was just during the fall sports. Um, the measures were not rigorous um, as it was a um, QI project and I had a very small budget. And um, in conclusion, you, um, funding is needed to build more processes and infrastructure for long-term growth. Connectivity issues um, will continue to be critical, um, particularly in areas that are more rural and don't have um, as good a Wi-Fi connections. However, I think as um, more areas um, develop that infrastructure, that will become less of a problem. <clears throat> there potentially is expansion to other sports medicine uses, and actually my trainers did use, um, although the study was just concussions, my trainers did use um, telemedicine for other sports medicine issues. And it is a foundation in which to build a much larger program. I had a budget initially of $6,100. Um, I got a grant from the American Association of Nurse Practitioners for $2,500, a scholarship from the Brain Injury Association of Washington for tuition. Um, HIPAA Bridge provided software support, and um, terrynell.com did graphics and web design for my web page. And these are my references. Do I have any questions? Hello, Dr. Markman. Thank you very much for that presentation. We definitely have quite a few questions for you. 
Great. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to start. Uh, if, if people have questions that they'd like to contribute now, please do. We're still gathering them. I'm going to introduce Eric Chetwind at this time, who's our general manager in healthcare. Hello, Eric. Hello. All yours. So, so first, uh, thanks again, Dr. Markman, for sharing that, um, sharing your study. And I know there's a lot of good uh, discussion to be had around it. I just wanted to take a quick moment. I think, uh, you know, Everbridge um, uh, has been involved in a number of different areas across the healthcare system with programs like Dr. Markman's, um, and we work across um, everything from issues around safety and security over to clinical solutions or clinical programs like Dr. Markman's program. Um, and to just give you a little background on that, <clears throat> of other examples, and I think uh, Dr. Markman was kind of alluding to other areas from a, a, a sports medicine perspective, but I'm sure many of you have seen the trends in telemedicine um, and some other areas that I know we've seen uh, applicability of these kinds of um, technologies and programs uh, range from everything from we, we've done some studies with the Mayo Clinic around telestroke and really managing patients in high acuity settings, uh, you know, basically on an ambulance on the way in. Um, which kind of really gets it sort of that access uh, to remote patients. We're also currently working on another program uh, um, just to share uh, with the Brigham and Women's here in Boston, which is a hospital at home program. Um, and that's basically post ED discharge, sending patients home rather than an inpatient stay, sending them home directly with remote monitoring and telemedicine uh, as an engagement program there. Um, and then we see, you know, a variety of programs um, are basically ranging everything from physician to physician teleconsults, particularly with special specialists um, that we're working on in a number of areas, um, as well as outpatient telehealth programs, so similar to a program like this, but everything ranging from family practice to OBGYN, dermatology, it's ophthalmology, um, many, many practices uh, uh, post, uh, post acute kind of care settings. Um, so I think we see a variety of programs. This is definitely a very exciting one. I just wanted to share a little bit about that. So certainly as, as we kind of go through today, we want to talk more about the concussion study because that's a very exciting uh, area. Um, but just to be aware that there are other areas that we see programs around this. And if you have questions around those, uh, we're happy to, to expound upon those post uh, the, today's conversation as well. Uh, so thanks for let me just take a minute to share some of that broader perspective. Um, are we ready with questions? Want to get to those? Yep, we have quite a few. Thank you so much. So I'm going to start with the first question early on in the program. Did you ever get any resistance from physicians that were also working on, on the injured person's care, like a pediatrician or maybe an ED doc? Was there any resistance you had with telehealth? Um, that was a great question, <clears throat> and the answer is no. Um, None of my, a lot of my kids don't have primary care providers, and so um, uh, Washington was one of the states that took the Medicaid expansion, and so a lot of these kids um, were Medicaid kids, and it's hard, honestly, it's hard to find primary care providers for some of these kids, so a lot of these kids don't have primary care providers. Um, if there was a kid that had a primary care provider, um, uh, I would see them on the sidelines and then have them follow up with that primary care provider. My role was not to usurp that of the primary care provider, but to assist the primary care provider when needed. Great. Thank you very much. And then we did get two or three questions around licensing. Um, licensing across states, licensing to be able to give the exams. Uh, we know that you're primarily based in Washington State, but do you have any insight on that? Um, I do. There currently is no compact for physicians or um, for nurse practitioners, so it, it's a huge issue um, being able to practice across state lines. And the answer, the short answer, is um, you need to have a license in the state that you're going to practice. For example. Um, the company that I worked with had two trainers that were in Oregon and wanted me to um, do telemedicine visits with them and I had to say no because I don't have an Oregon license. Um, it's not something that is out of the question of getting a license in another state, but it certainly is um, 
not something that I wanted to undertake just for this process and for this study. Great. But okay. Uh, and then I have one question from Scott. Do you have any cases that would be classified as post-concussion syndrome? Um, no. What I would do if the kids weren't getting better, um, they would either, at, we would see them in the clinic, and then if they weren't getting better, um, they would go either see their primary, or if they didn't have a primary, um, I would have them come into my clinic um, and then send them, if they needed neurocognitive testing, I work very closely um, with the folks up at Harborview at the Seattle Sports and Spine um, Clinic or at Children's Hospital with their sports concussion program and we would get them on up there if they needed neurocognitive uh, testing done. Um, I didn't have any kids that had any concussions um, that warranted that, um, warranted any referrals, but if they would have needed it, we could facilitate that and instead of them waiting a couple of weeks to go through the process, um, they would have been able to get in right away. Great, thank you very much. I did get a uh, couple more questions. We're 18 were ATC able to document the notes of telemedicine visits of their athletes in a timely manner? Uh, yes. And what I would do is um, document and then send them my notes as well. Fax them to them. That was the follow-up question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then, thank you, Emily. Uh, and then, how do you bill for your services? So, when you're using telemedicine, how do you sort of integrate that into your billing cycle? So, for this project, that's a great question. And for this project, I didn't bill um, because I wanted to prove proof of concept. I wanted to prove that it could be done. Um, in Washington State, you actually can bill, and it depends on what state you're in, whether or not you can bill for telemedicine or not. In Washington State, as long as you have a physical clinic um, that you can see patients in, you can bill for equal time and, and assessment. You have to be able to do, for example, um, I have to, would have to be able to do the same exam on a telemedicine visit that I was doing in an in-office visit. And that's part of why we wanted to prove the proof of concept, um, which we were able to do. You can do using the SCAD-3 and using the, um, having the trainer assist you, you can do a very similar exam to what you would do in office. So if I wanted to, as we continue this forward, um, that will be the next step is being able to develop it so that you can't I can build uh, and, and I would say from our practitioners around the country uh, agree very much that it does vary by state on how you can bill um, usually it's a two letter tag that you add on to the regular billing codes that you're using um, and the other threshold that we find a lot of times is that video needs to be involved um, a phone call usually doesn't count, but a video call will. So again, it's something to check with your providers and check with your state, but those are some kind of general guidelines that we know of. Um, I do have one final question which came in specifically about your study. So uh, uh, it says a seven-day follow-up follow is sort of the average time when there's been a concussion injury to an a student athlete, but you were doing it with a with a one day follow up. Is is that something that you would look to build out going forward so that we can do, you know, less time equals better outcomes, anything like that? Well I didn't I would see the kids with the trainer. The trainers would follow them you at usually at at uh, especially for football, if the concussion occurred Friday night for football, we would see them then, and then the trainers would see them again on Monday, and then they would relay back and forth to me how the kids were doing. So we may or may not do another formal visit. Um, sometimes we did, um, but we may not do a formal visit, but they were being followed by the trainers, and there was close follow-up and contact and communication with the trainers. And again, in Washington State, um, the athletic trainers are licensed to manage concussions and 
return them to play, the athletes to play. So it, it wasn't that they weren't being followed, they weren't being ignored after the one day. If that makes sense. Yep, yep. Um, I think that's it for questions. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Dr. Markman, thank you very much for sharing your study results with us. We hope that um, there'll be some more studies we can work on down the road together. It was great having your, your knowledge and your input in this area. For, on behalf of Eric Chetwind and myself, thank you for coming. We will be sending out the slides and the video recording in just a few days. We look forward to seeing everybody soon. Thank you.